Welcome to Waterbury House. Come in. My name's Simon Buchanan and I'm going to be your guide for today for the Fresco Tour. Uh, they, my title is Steward, uh, so I'm the steward of the Waterbury Estate and I look after it on behalf of the School of Economic Science. I don't know many other stewards. The only other real steward I know is the steward of Gondor, and he jumped off a cliff. And sometimes I know exactly how he feels. So I look after the whole estate, which is about 80 acres, and that includes an orchard, which is out that way, uh, the, eight, the eight and a half acres of formal gardens out that way, the garden centre, which is out that way. I'm kind of pointing through walls, but I hope you know what I'm talking about and the nursery and then also we have about eight cottages on the estate too some of which house elderly retainers and some others young garden staff and apprentices and things like that and then also i look after this georgian pile well georgian and jacobean because it's georgian here at the front and jacobean down at the back so a little bit about the history of the place it's only been owned by three families, as far back as anyone can remember. Um, and the first recorded lot are the medieval lot called the Fitzillies. And they were here from, well, the earliest recorded memory of them, obviously, is the Doomsday Book, so that's 1086. And they were here up until about 1575. And um, if you go into the church next door, you can see a reclining Fitzilly knight. He's got his legs crossed, but I'm sh pretty sure it didn't go on a crusade. After the Fitzalix came the Curzons, and they made their money in wool, in sheep farming. And uh, the Curzons built most of what you see here, the Georgian part of the house. After them came the Henleys, and they made their money in, uh, in shipping. And it's said that some of the beams of the house, the ship's beams, I don't know how true that is, they often say that about old houses, but definitely if you sleep in room 10 you fall out of bed a lot because the floor is pretty wonky where the old wooden beams are. Uh, it's said that the eldest son of the uh, Henley family was quite keen on gambling, so uh, one day he rolled the dice and he lost a lot to, um, and had to sell it and sold it to Magdalen College just down the road in Oxford. They added it to their property portfolio um, and they had it for a few years until this amazing lady called Beatrix Haberwall came along. You might have heard of Beatrix Haberwall, she's one of the two stellar lady gardeners in the history of the last century in the UK and she'd started a school for young ladies down the road in Pusey and she came up here looking for bigger premises. She came with her lady partner, Avis, so I guess that was quite an alternative for the day. And the myth is that Avis distracted the board, probably in the withdrawing room over there. And uh, then Beatrice Hannibal went off into the gardens with her gardening fork. And uh, she dug to see what the soil was like. And the soil here is amazing, so it's about from here down to the floor, light loam. She decided this is where she was going to have her gardening school. And the gardening school started in about 1935 here and went on through the war years. The war years helped her. Um, she was given the West Field actually where we've got our orchard now um, and some help from the land army and uh, the military came in and helped too. Um, she's famous for being a great communicator about gardens, passionate and under her tutelage she uh, she helped lady gardeners become head gardeners in what was previously very much a man's world. Uh, the other thing she was famous for was probably 15 years of winning gold medals at Chelsea for her Royal Sovereign Strawberries, uh, apart from one year I think when they got a silver gilt and I wouldn't have liked to have been on the team knowing what she was like. If you want to know what she looked like we've got a few pictures over here, I don't know if you can see them, but uh, just on the table here, there's a few pictures of both Beatrix Havergal. And you can see she's a statuesque looking lady. She's head and shoulders above the rest of her girls. 
an apparently Roald Dahl based um, Miss Trunchbull from Matilda on her. In the 1970s, the 1970s came along and she retired, Abbas had died, and she was looking for an organisation to sell it to. And she decided to sell it to an organisation called the School of Economic Science, who I'm employed by. Uh, principally because she went into one of their gardening sheds and she found that their forks and spades and things were well oiled. So she thought these were good people to leave the place to. The School of Economic Science started in 1935, or around that sort of time, by a chap called Leon McLaren. And he was really keen in economics, as you would expect. He was particularly keen on the economic, in the economics of Henry George and the idea of land value taxation. The working man shouldn't be taxed at all, and the only tax that should be levied is, is tax on land. Of course, everyone in charge had all the land, so that didn't get too far. But it's still taught in the School of Economic Science, or the School of Philosophy and Economic Science, as its name has recently been changed to until this day. So this building is used as a residential building. People come here on the weekends and study economics, and, but mostly philosophy these days. Um, Leon McLaren, as I said, was really keen on economics, but he was also really keen on the human condition and the idea of, it, of course it was the time of the Great Depression in the 1930s, and so he was really keen on uh, equality and digging people out of poverty. And the more he looked into it, the more he got interested in philosophy, and he started reading the works of the Western wizards of the day, Gurdjieff and Uspensky and people like that. And um, in all their texts, it says, and their lectures and stuff, it says, I don't think we've found the answer yet, but I think the answer's in the East. So time passed, and he was teaching courses on economics and philosophy, as I say, um, and then he and a chap called Dr. Rolls decided to travel off to the East and look for this answer. So they went off to India together, and they looked all around India, and they didn't really find anything until towards the end of their trip, they went to the big, one of the big spiritual mailers, where millions of people congregate together at the site of the holy rivers, at the Ganges, the Yamuna, and the Saraswati. And there they happened to sit at the feet of this chap called Sri Shandananda Saraswati. And he told them about a philosophy called a Dwaita philosophy. So a Dwaita is just made up of two little words, a and Dwaita. And a means not, and Dwaita means to. So the whole philosophy is summed up in the words not to. Anyway, Leon McCarran was no fool, he was a skilled barrister and he cross-examined this, this amazing person and eventually decided that he really knew what he was talking about. So he came back to London and he told his economics faculty, OK guys, we're going to stop studying economics, we're going to concentrate on philosophy as much as possible, and uh, not just any old philosophy, but this weird stuff I've just picked up from India. And everyone said, OK, and they swallowed it hook, line, sinker, and from then on, the School of Economic Science, as it was called, became principally a philosophy study society. So I'm just telling you all this before we go through and look at the frescoes, because you need to know the background to it. If you go through this door on my right, you go through to the old part of the house. If you go through this door on the left, you go through the, to the new part of the house. So we're going to go through the left door for the moment. So this is what we call the Artist Hall. Um, in the 1990s, the School of Economic Science, as it was called then, got permission from South Oxfordshire District Council to gut this part of the building. I remember when I was a kid, I used to come here, and it was all dark and uh, bits of oak panelling and windy, dark, creaky staircases. It was the kind of place where the butler used to creep up the stairs and go, you called madam. Um, but they got permission to change all this and it must have been because the proposal was so good because it's a grade two listed building. 
So the interesting thing about this organisation is it's full of little subgroups. So there's architects groups and artists groups and music groups and language groups and needlework groups, all sorts of groups that like to study what they study but within relation to philosophy. So the architects group got hold of it and they decided to make it this light, bright, open space and they wanted to base their architecture on their philosophy so the two things I remember from that is they decided to base the whole thing on a single unit length which they called the module and they scratched their heads for a bit to decide what that unit length would be and then some bright spark said I know let's base it on the original proportions of the building so they went to the Georgian end of the building and they measured it up and they came up with a length about that long and then just as they were about to start the new build another bright spark said well you better check it if it's the Jacobean end of the building down there so they went rushing down that end with their stick and it didn't fit so then they cut a little bit off the end of their stick until it did fit and then of course the new length of the stick didn't fit the Georgian end of the building anymore so they, anyway they went rushing backwards and forwards like something from an eating comedy until eventually they came up with the ultimate compromise of 24 and 3 quarter inches. I don't know what that is in metric. But so everything in this place is based on that module. So the whole length of the hall is 25 modules long. The width of the hall is 5 wide and the paving slabs are exactly the size of that module. 24 and 3 quarter inches I think it is. And so there's no real golden section or golden proportions or anything like that going on in here. It's all simple multiples of that length. The other thing they did is they stuck a gold spot in the middle of the floor to represent the centre of the hall from their, um, on their drawing boards, as it were. So that's real gold. So now getting out your pen knife, your virtual pen knife, and digging it out. And if you look up from that spot, it goes straight through the centre of the skylight above our heads. So you can imagine this invisible line that everything was taken off. Anyway, then the artists came along and they said, right, we're going to cover these walls with, uh, with stories and things to tell people about our philosophy. And they liked doing things properly in this organisation. So they had heard that the best way to paint on walls was to use a technique called fresco. Nobody knew how to paint fresco. So they had to research and find out how to do that. And I suppose the best way to describe it to you is to tell you what I saw over the years when I came in. And that's before they started doing the painting. I came in here and it was all just brickwork. And onto the brickwork they hung a stainless steel mesh all over the brickwork. And they screwed their stainless steel mesh into the walls with stainless steel screws. And then Mr Jolly, the head plasterer, came along and he threw two coats of lime plaster onto the walls. So this is lime plaster mixed with horsehair to give it strength and flexibility. Mr Jolly apparently was a bit of a laugh. That's my best joke. And uh, anyway, so the, these walls looked like lumpy bumpy porridge all over the place. So they've got two coats of plaster on and then the artists had to come along and they had to put on the top coat of plaster themselves before painting. But they could only put on as much plaster as they could paint in a day. If you look really closely at the walls, you can see seams of where one day's work finished and another day's work began. So for instance, they would take an area, say about this big, and they'd plaster it all up before breakfast and make it really flat and smooth and then they'd come along and they'd paint on it with uh, raw pigment and a bit of distilled water and paint straight into the fresh plaster while it was still wet and as they touched it with their paint brushes the paint would flow off into the wet plaster so it was more than just a surface covering it actually sunk in a little bit into the plaster so that's why it's such a good technique because it's it's not just a surface covering, it's actually a little bit in there. Of course, the major catches to this are that you can't make any mistakes. 
because as soon as you've, as you've touched the wet plaster, it's sunk in there and so you can't rub it out or scrape it off or anything like that. So you have to work really quickly, really deftly, and if you haven't finished by the time the day's over and the plaster's dried, you've got to scrape it all off and start again. The other thing is you have to know what colour the paint's going to be, not when you're putting it on, but when it dries. So they had to do loads of test, tests and see what colour the paint changed to. Because I guess plaster's got quite a high pH or a low pH and uh, it changes the colours quite dramatically. So the flesh tones, for instance, when they first painted them on, were a lot darker than they are now and they faded a lot. Apparently when you're painting a white on, it looks just like water as you paint it on and then it gets whiter and whiter and whiter. So the layout of the whole hall was the design of Bernard Saunders, who uh, was the steward before I came along, about five or six years ago. And he decided it should be laid out in this way, that the top floor should represent the spiritual world, the middle floor, or the first floor, should represent the subtle world, and down here, we're in the physical world. So if you're up for the big adventure, we'll go up to the top of the house and look at the spiritual world first. Okay, so this atrium, most people really don't pay much attention to this area, but this is supposed to represent the spiritual world. People usually come here on a Friday night, they struggle up the staircase with their suitcases, and then afterwards we tell them there was a lift. And they, uh, by that time, they're usually a bit puffed like I am, and they're just heading for their bedrooms, so this whole floor is full of bedrooms, uh, or the bathroom or something like that, and they don't really notice this area. But this area in the design was supposed to represent the spiritual world, as I said. And the major thing you'll see about it when you look at it, first of all, it's really bright and light. But the second thing you'll notice after a while is there's an oval shape that goes through the whole area, goes right round and even goes through the skirting board. And I'm pretty sure that this oval shape is supposed to represent the idea of potentiality. So if you think about things in creation that are oval, I guess they're usually things like eggs that are going to hatch into something. So here we are, this place is supposed to be full of potential and brightness. Uh, the other thing you'll see here as you look around is that there are three colours that get kicked in around the place. Now according to who you talk to in the organisation, they either represent uh, the three qualities of the divine, which are truth, consciousness, and happiness. Um, I'm not sure which is which. I guess you can choose. Or, the other thing they could be representing is the three guna. So in this tradition, uh, guna is a Sanskrit word, another Sanskrit word, that means string. And it's said in the tradition that there are three energies in creation and uh, there's a kind of holding energies, energy which is represented by the blue colour and there's a very kind of busy energy which is represented by the red colour uh, so these correlate to the times of day as well so the blue colour obviously co correlates to night time the red 
daytime. Uh, busy energy would be most obviously seen in things like human beings running around and squirrels and sausage dogs and things like that. And uh, obviously the sort of quiet holding energy would be most obviously seen in things like rocks and mountains and trees and things like that. And then the third energy, this is the yellow colour, is supposed to be the fine energy that you get from uh, fine work and meditation. And the time of day that relates to is dawn and dusk. So that's why you'll see that people tend to meditate and do fine work at those kind of times of the day. So that's just a quick overview. I'm hoping you don't have too many questions about the spiritual world. And anyway, you can't ask them today. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to make our way down the staircase. Again, halfway down the staircase, we'll, uh, we'll have a look at the panels that Bernard Saul has put up on the wall. So, we've got some panels here. Bernard decided that he was going to put up on the wall uh, the Ten Laws of Manu. If you were brought up in, a, in an Indian tradition, you might have heard of Manu as an ancient lawgiver, just as, as in the Christian tradition, we'd have heard of Moses and the Ten Commandments. Well, spookily enough, there are Ten Laws of Manu too. And these are, I'll start from the corner here. So these are, don't get angry. So you can see a little devil there pulling his, pulling his trouser leg and going, go on, go and hit him. So don't get angry. Truthfulness is the next one along, represented by staying on a straight path and not going on a woggly path. The next one along is discrimination between the real and the unreal. And that contains a story about a snake and a rope. And the idea is that if you walked into a dark room and there was a coiled up rope on the ground, you might think, oh, a snake! But with the light of knowledge, by turning on the light switch, you can see clearly that it is just a rope and not a snake. The next one along is wisdom. And then up from that, we've got do not steal, uh, which is one of the Ten Commandments as well. But the interesting thing about this definition of do not steal is that it also means don't take more than you need. Uh, which includes things like new run. And then right in the middle there, we've got uh, cleanliness of mind, body and heart. And then one along from there, we've got control of the senses. There's usually someone in a corner somewhere doing the opposite. One up from there, we've got um, self-control. So you can see in there, it's putting out the flames of passion. And there's someone in the corner running off, not very self-controlled. Next to that, we've got forgiveness, and then right at the top, we've got contentment. I never used to, uh, represented by an unflickering flame, I never used to be able to remember that one, so I think I must be becoming more content. All these panels are exactly the module we spoke about downstairs wide, and they were modelled by a man called Nathan David, who was a great sculptor, very good at things like ballet dancers, and things like that. They're all, uh, modelled in clay and then cast into a white resin. Okay, we'll go on down. So this door represents the subtle world and uh, by the subtle world I think what Bernard meant was everything that's really real to us but you can't actually put your finger on it. So it's the inner world. It's the world of the mind, the world of the heart, the world of feelings, imaginings, thoughts. So down this end of the hall here are represented the two things that people do when they come on a spiritual retreat here. Uh, students of the school of philosophy and primary thing they'll do is meditate 
The kind of meditation they do here is mantra meditation. Um, and that's where you're given a single word and you repeat it in the mind. And in that way, it brings the mind to stillness. Because we all know what it's like if someone says to you, okay, close your eyes and don't think about anything. Before long, some thought comes into the mind. And it's either something like, I bet they're all looking at me like I'm a real wobbly. Or it'll be, I've left the ironing on. Uh, or the iron on, I guess you should say. Um, so, if you're given a word to repeat in mind, it's much easier because you've got a single thing to focus on. And gradually, gradually, you can bring the mind to stillness. The other thing they do here is they practice what they call in Sanskrit satsanga. So that simply translates as meaning good company. So the idea is that they'll gather together in groups, maybe of about 15 or 20 or less, and uh, they'll study um, whatever the philosophical topic is of the day, you know, asking those big questions like why are we here, what's it all about, what happens after you die, what's the meaning of life, all those kind of things. Those big questions, it's much easier to ask in a group and discuss in a group of like-minded people. Because uh, then you get the support and you get the experience of everyone else in the group. Above our heads here, we've got the phases of the moon, uh, which also tie in with the idea in, uh, in this philosophy of the Shakti, or the powers available to man or womankind. Over on this wall here, you'll see an upside down pot. You'll see quite a few upside down pots downstairs as well. Um, well, and right way up pots now, I can't think of it. Pots, generally speaking, are used, have been used by art, the artist here as a metaphor for the human body. So, this particular pot's got five holes in it, and those five holes represent the five senses. So you've got smell, hearing, sight, touch, and then the grapes of taste. Um, and then in the middle you've got a little light which represents the inner light or inner consciousness. The only reason that the pot's upside down is so that there are only five holes in the pot rather than six holes and they're all an equal size. So it's basically a description of the human condition. We're like a pot and the light in us with five holes in it through which we perceive the world, you could say. As we go along this way, we get into some stories. The first one is a slightly politically incorrect story these days about a sage called Yajna Walkya. And one day he comes home to his wives called Maitre and Katyayani and he says to the two of them, okay, I'm off to the forest to become enlightened, but before I go, I'm going to divide my wealth between the two of you. And one of his wives says, okay, that sounds like a plan. But the other one says, hold on a minute. If where you're going is so much better than this wealth, I'm coming with you. So they're both going off to the spiritual world, or moving that direction, and she's moving more to the physical world. Next, we get to this great big tree, which is the biggest feature of the hall. And this is the Bodhi tree, or the tree of knowledge. And as all the horticulturists amongst you will notice, this tree is different from most trees in that it's upside down. So its roots are up in the spiritual world, and its fruits and flowers are in the physical world. Now the artists get a bit tricksy now, and because they know that people are going to be coming here more than once, and they're going to get pretty bored if all they see is an upside down tree. So, into the tree, they've put lots of other stories. And the principal story they've put in this tree is a story about two birds. And the story goes, it's said that within each of us, there are two birds. And they both have the same name, and one of those birds is always getting its beak stuck into everything and getting fully involved with the world. 
Uh, but there's another world that's still and quiet and unattached and just watches. Uh, now it's quite difficult to see the second bird, so the clues are you need to look up and look for an eye. Uh, and the other clues are that it's really big and it's a bit abstract. So I don't know if you can see it, but if you look up at the top where the trunk meets the first gold leaves, just underneath there is a circle, like, like the eye at the beginning of a James Bond film. And uh, that's the eye of a, big, of a great big bird. And also the edge of his body, if I touch the edge of his body, you can see that's the outside of the bird. And if you sort of look as if you're looking in a way in a player's body, but you'll see that there's a great big bird hidden in the tree. I, did, I do think they got a bit tricksy, it was quite difficult to see. Uh, two other big, big frescoes on this floor. Uh, if we stand back and look up the top there, there's a great big green fresco. Now when you first look at it, you can see it's full of bubbles and ripples and raindrops. Um, but the idea is to remember that it's all made of the same substance, the same water. So it's a good way of describing this Advaita philosophy. It looks like there's all sorts of different forms, but underneath it, it's all made of the same substance. And then if we walk along this way and look back, we can see that there's another one. And uh, this is supposed to depict the two things you need for spiritual work. So that's love and wisdom. And the love is represented by the two hands, like the two hands of a potter and a potter's wheel. And the wisdom is represented by that cosmic heat triangle thing. Uh, Charles Hardacre, who was one of the main artists, along with Jeffrey Courtney, that did this, and they got some really good help from Valerie Petz. Lots of other uh, apprentices and helpers. It took them about seven years to paint this place. Um, he was quite keen, as I, as he was quite keen on things like triangles and sort of Egyptian style philosophy. So you'll see a lot of that popping up around the place. Um, we'll just skip over these. Uh, these dairy lean cheeses here. But if you want to know, you can always come to Water Parade for a tour and I'll give you a description of those. But it's probably a bit complicated for today. Uh, but we can just look here above the doors here, there are three round doors. Um, and these are supposed to represent the three stages of, of uh, learning. So the first one is when you just copy down what the teacher tells you. I think we all know that one. The second stage is when you can do your own work. I think some of us know about that one. And then the third stage is when the knowledge is within you. And you don't need to refer to any books at all. You hope when you're under the surgeon's knife that he's at that stage of knowledge. Okay, we'll go downstairs, but while we're on this floor, maybe we can have a quick look in the ballroom, because it's the nicest room in the house. Um, so we just wander through. We're in the old part of the house now. Uh, we've got a sculpture of, uh, of the founder of the School of Economic Science, or the School of Philosophy and Economic Science. So this is what Leon McLaren looked like. And we'll go through here, and here's the ballroom. Which, uh, the furniture is all a bit stacked up in here because uh, I think some of the members of the household do yoga these days. So they're probably doing yoga in here earlier this morning. And I just thought I'd show you this room because it's a lovely big open room, a bit of Adam's esque fresco around the top. A proper only fools and horses shown the living. Uh, and this is the main meeting room of the house. So uh, if you came here on a spiritual residential, you'll probably get up really early in the morning, like about five o'clock in the morning, um, and then you'll do some meditation, and then you'll help make breakfast, and then you might have a meeting in a small group, and you'll do some philosophy and study your philosophy for the day, and then you might have tea, the whole place runs on tea and coffee, 
and then you do some practical work and your time put into practice during that practical work session, whatever it was that you had been talking about in your morning philosophy session. So it might have been something like, um, see what happens when you really give attention to where the working surfaces meet. And then you might practice that in your work session. And then at the end of it, come back and tell people what you experienced. Something like that. Um, and then they have lunch. And, uh, and then after that, they do some, a bit of work around the place again. Then they probably have another study session in the afternoon. They might look at something from the Gita or the Upanishads or even something from Emerson or Shakespeare or, or who knows what well, any kind of philosophy can be can be studied here um, and it's all about seeing the unity in all the different philosophies rather than the differences so there's all sorts of people from all sorts of walks of life that sit in this room um, and then after that they'd probably all come here for a quick gathering in this room so there's no deification here. I know it looks like this, uh, this chair's on some kind of throne, but really people only sit up here taking these meetings on this throne-like thing, on this dais, so they can see the people falling asleep at the back of the room. As you can imagine, after a long day, when you got up at five o'clock in the morning, you might be ready to snore. And also, with both the fires going, it can get quite warm in here. Anyway, then they have supper. There's no, oh, they've probably meditated before supper. There's no ban on alcohol, so quite often people get a bit jolly. Uh, and then uh, they might have an evening meeting here and someone might play the piano or give them a lecture or something like that. So not particularly related to philosophy necessarily. Uh, the other things that you can see in this room is uh, up there is a, is a photograph of Sri Shantananda Saraswati, if you want to know what he looked like. And he died at the end of the last century. And the person that took over his position, we've got another photograph of over here. And he's waving at us very happily. And he's called uh, Sri Vasudevananda Saraswati. So he sits in one of the holy seats, or the seats of the Shankaracharya in the north, of the north. And uh, to this day, the person that runs the organisation goes off and has a chat with him or a conference with him once or maybe twice a year and asks any questions that students have asked. Okay, so I just thought I'd show you this room because it's so nice. And we'll go down the stairs now. Uh, we've got some pictures of the grumpy old curtains looking down on us. These are painted on canvas and inserted into the walls. And there's quite a nice stained glass window that we can't see too well actually at this time of the day. But if you want to see some great stained glass, nip into the church next door and you can see some great stuff. This stained glass, after Henry VIII had, uh, had smashed all the, all the stained glass in the churches, it was really trendy after that time to go to Europe on the Grand, uh, the grand Tour and pick up some stained glass and come back with it and they'd make up a collage of stained glass. So you can see there's some strange mismatched pieces in there. Okay, so we're getting down to the physical world now. As you go down the main staircase, you can feel how nicely the stair treads are cut. And you can imagine swishing down here with Mr. Darcy in your ball gown. So here we are in the physical world. And the first thing you'll, you'll notice about this place is that there's four stripes going around the walls. Now these four stripes are supposed, are supposed to represent the four different types of creature and these don't fit into any scientific modern day theory at all. But here we go, so we've got the womb-born creatures in this green stripe and then we've got the egg-born creatures in the blue stripe and then we've got the dirt and moisture-born creatures including stinging insects in this brown stripe and then at the bottom, we've got the earthborn creatures. The other thing we've got going on in the hall here is we've got four different trees around the place which represent the four seasons. So we've got spring, uh, summer, autumn, and winter. 
And then all the rest of the hall is teaching stories from this tradition. Uh, some of them are great fun. Uh, probably the most famous teaching story of all is the one on the end wall here. And this is a story about ten people who cross a river. And the story goes, once upon a time there were ten people and they got in a boat. You can kind of see the boat goes through the door. They got in an upside down boat. And they got in a boat and they started rowing across the river. And then halfway across, the storm came and the wind blew and the boat capsized. And everybody in the boat got out of the boat and they swam to one side of the river. And then one of the party said, OK, I'm going to do a head count and check there's no one missing. So he went, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh no, there's someone missing. And then his friend said, sit down, Bill. You never can count. I'm going to do the counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No, you're right. There are only nine. Anyway, everyone had a go at counting and everyone got to nine. But luckily, and then they started crying and wailing and looking for the missing person. Luckily for them, though, a holy man came along in a yellow packamac. And when he heard what the problem was, he grabbed a stick and he whacked each one of them on the shoulder and he went, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And the moral of the story, of course, is that you should never forget yourself. Okay, this is a story about, uh, about a dancing hermit. So the story goes, once upon a time, Narada, the messenger of the gods, the chap in the blue dress, was flying through the sky, and he was flying along, and he saw a hermit sitting meditating under a tamarind tree. So he flipped down out of the sky and screeched to a halt in front of the hermit, and said, oh hermit, what are you doing? And the hermit, hermit opened his eyes and said, Oh, I'm meditating under a tamarind tree, but while you're here, O Narada, can you take a message to God for me? And Narada said, well, Okay, it's a bit irregular, but if you like. So the hermit said, Can you ask God when we're going to meet? So Narada flew off to God, and he met God, and he said, I've just met this hermit meditating under a tamarind tree, and he wants to know when you two are going to meet. Well, God thought for a millisecond and said, Tell him that we will meet when as many years have passed as there are leaves on his tamarind tree. So a bit later, Narada flew back down to the hermit, and all that. And the hermit opened his eyes and said, Ha, ah, Narada, what news? And Narada said, I don't think you're going to like it. And the hermit said, come on, tell me. So Narada said, okay, well, God said that you two would meet when as many years have passed as there are leaves on your tamarind tree. And when he heard the news, the hermit jumped up and started dancing for joy. And uh, Narada said to him, well, why are you dancing for joy? He's just told you he's not going to meet you for thousands of years. And the hermit just said, yeah, but we will meet. And the story goes that when God heard this devotion, he or she came running barefoot, and the meeting was instantaneous. Narada, of course, complained, because he said, you know, this really messed with his street cred, because his word was supposed to mean something. But um, God just said to him, in these circumstances, the normal rules do not apply. I've got another so story here. I've got a shaggy donkey story. Uh, so this is a story about St. Egnath. And uh, St. Egnath was the priest at the tem temple of Shiwa. And one day he was asked to go and get holy water for Shiwa. So he took his bottle and he put his cork in the top of his bottle and he put it on his back and he travelled for hours 
and hours and hours and days and days and days and months and months and months and weeks and weeks and weeks and years and years and years <laughs> until finally he got to the source of the holy water and he took the bottle off his back and he uncorked it and he stooped down and he filled it up from the source of the holy water and he put the cork back in and he put it back on his back and then he travelled for years and years and years and months and months and months and weeks and weeks and weeks and days and days and days and hours and minutes. anyway he was almost back when there in front of him on the road he saw a dying donkey. Without hesitation, he took the bottle of water, the holy water, off his back, and he uncorked it. The donkey was dying at first, of course. And he poured it down the throat of the dying donkey. As the dying donkey was revived, he jumped up, and said, Eg Egnath stood up and said, O Shiva, I travelled for many miles to bring you this holy water. But luckily, I met you along the way. <laughs> uh, so the whole place is full of stories. I can point them out to you, but you'll probably have to come here to hear all the stories. There's a special story here. If you look down here, you can see there's a ring, a golden ring, with the words Rama on it. And there's a special story connected with that one. There's another story here about a lion and a lion cub. Uh, there are stories on this end wall. Well, basically, I told you about the pots upstairs. Well, these pots represent people as well. And the water represents spiritual teaching. And there are some people that are less receptive to spiritual teaching than other people. You know, people like myself. And you'll find that they're upside down pots. But or well, they like upside down pots. But even those people, still a little drop of water creeps in under the rim. And of course they're, you know, they're more receptive people with open necks. And then there are a few people who are the, the great spiritual teachers and they have water as if it were spouting out of them. And then there's some more pots over here. Um, if you take a step back, you can look right up to the top and you can see there's a great big sun up the top and then there are lots of rays coming from the sun and then down here from the pots and these again represent human beings and in each of these pots are uh, the same suns being reflected in each one of these pots. So it's another way of describing this as white of philosophy, that it's the same in all of us. Uh, one thing I suppose I shouldn't really miss out is there's a sculpture over here. And this sculpture, again, is related to the whole hall. Um, it was carved with that module in mind, so all the proportions are the same as that original module we talked about. And this represents, again, the four different types of creature. So we've got three womb-born creatures at the top, we've got a human being, we've got a stag, and a sheep, um, so there's three of them. And then we've got three egg-born creatures. We've got a bird of prey here, and a fish. And then round the back there's a lizard of some sort, there's a newt, I think. And then the next level we've got, um, we've got three different types of earth-born creatures. So we've got an oak tree, and a, a blackberry, and then round on this side we've got a rose. And then right down the bottom, we've got some dirt and moisture born creatures. So there's a tapeworm up the top there. There's a tardigrade, which is one of those creatures that can stop its life cycle when the mud dries out. And then round the back, there's a mosquito. So this, uh, this sculpture was all carved in hot wood limestone which is a lovely uh, stone to carve. 
It's quite hard for a limestone, it used to be called English marble, and it's got these lovely little bits of mica that you can see reflected. Um, it was carved in three different bits, and you can see the joints. There's, a, there's one around the middle of a sheep, and there's another one just through the fish's tail here. So this is a bit of my stone carving. I'm a stone carver by trade, and I carved this before I got the job here as steward. I've always noticed, though, that they put this sculpture next to the toilets. <laughs> okay, so that's a, that's a whistle stop tour of the hall. Um, I could show you the rest of the house, but I think that's probably enough for this session. So thank you all for coming. It's been real. <laughs>